Welcome everyone to the 33rd meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2018 and our last of the year. Can we please ensure all electronic devices are on silent mode? We have apologies from Gail Ross and I welcome Linda Fabiani in her place. Our first item today is a decision on whether to take item three in private. Item three is a discussion on the evidence we will receive today on the 2019-20 budget from the Minister for Older People and Equalities. Do we all agree to take this item in private? Thank you. Our second item of business is an oral evidence session on the 2019-20 budget with the Minister for Older People and Equalities. We'd like to welcome Christina McKelvey, Minister for Older People and Equalities, Sean Stronach, Equalities Unit, Scottish Government, Liz Hawkins, Senior Principal Research Officer, Scottish Government. You're all very welcome. And can I invite the Minister to make opening remarks of around five minutes? Yeah, thank you very much, Convener, um, and thank you so much uh, for allowing me to appear in front of your committee today, um, the second time in, 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 in some weeks. Um, it, but this morning we're focusing on the 2019-2020 draft budget. Can I, just before I make uh, go into the, the substance of my open remarks, uh, pay tribute to the committee and the work that they undertook uh, to realise the Human Rights Takeover Day, which I thought was a magnificent event. Um, it, it demonstrated this place at its best, um, right across whether it was government or the officials or indeed uh, committee members and all the speakers. But I have to say the highlight for me were all of the young people who had st some stuff to say. And I think maybe working together in joint endeavours, we might realise some of those young people's dreams uh, and hopes. And, and I'm really looking forward to undertaking that work in, in my role. I'm really looking forward to addressing in the committee's uh, questions this morning on my own portfolio budget and the progress that we have made in equalities, uh, on the equalities budget statement. As you know, there's a whole range of activity across the government that supports the mainstreaming of equality, and I know the committee's been instrumental in, in helping realise that. And my ministerial colleagues have also all shown how they are taking equalities uh, and tackling inequalities across health, justice, employment, educational attainment and accessibility. Even at a time when the UK has imposed an, uh, an austerity um, has meant a real terms cut to the Scottish <coughs> Government's budget. The draft budget delivered over £700 million of additional resources investment to health and care services with a substantial uplift for mental health. There are expanded budgets for early learning and childcare and for colleges and higher education, while the attainment fund included £120 million for the pupil equity funding. Um, these are all crucial areas in reducing inequality, I'm hope, I would hope you would agree. Uh, this year, we are demonstrating our commitment to improving openness and transparency by clearly setting out the total operating costs for the Scottish Government in the 1920 uh, budget within each portfolio. And within the equality budget this year means a headline rise to £24.6 million, which includes the total operating costs element. So this budget will help us deliver on our commitments set out in the Race Equality Action Plan, the Disability Action Plan and the Equally Safe Strategy, amongst others, showing our commitment to respecting, protecting and implementing human rights for everyone in Scotland. Tackling uh, violence against women and girls is a particularly cross-cutting area where we will... Uh, we, where Whereas, as well as significant resources from my own portfolio, my justice colleagues continue to invest significant resources too, including this year funding the expansion of the innovative Caledonian programme to tackle domestic abuse. We will also deliver a full response to the reports from the First Minister's Advisory Council on Women and Girls and the Human Rights Leadership Group. This government also recognises a contribution, contribution made by older people, and this budget will support a renewed focus through our older people's framework. It will also deliver the implementation of our social isolation and loneliness strategy, which I just launched the other day. As in previous years, equality analysis um, and assessment has been undertaken alongside the budget and was published last week in the Equality Budget Statement. Um, this is an important document, I'm sure you'll agree, and one which we are striving to continually improve. As in previous years, we have been supported in the equality budget process by the Equality Budget Advisory Group. And I would like to put on record our thanks to its members for their expertise, insight and challenge that they bring as we continue to look for the best ways to ensure proper consideration of equality in our budgetary processes. In recognition of the need for further improvement around equality and human rights budgeting, you will be aware, aware that in September this year, we invited Dr Angela O'Hagan to become the first independent chair 
of the Equality Budget uh, Group ad Advisory Group. Angela has set out a work programme for 2019, and we thank her for her continued enthusiasm and commitment to improving the budget process. And I believe the committee had a conversation with Angela recently too. I and my officials look forward to working with Angela and the rest of EBAG to dis to decide what future analysis and approaches are feasible and useful given the available data, methodologies and resources. Can I thank you again uh, for um, allowing me to speak at your committee today and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Minister. And we'll move straight on to questions. Um, Mary Fee. Convener, and good morning, um, Minister, and good morning to your officials. I wonder if I could perhaps start by asking um, you... Who has overall responsibility for equalities and human rights? Because it's something that, that concerns me, because equalities and, and human rights cuts across every single portfolio. Now, committee, I've had a letter from Shirley Ann Somerville confirming that she has overall responsibility for equalities. But, but I wonder if you could perhaps um, give us a flavour of what that responsibility looks like and where your responsibility sits in relation to the other cabinet secretaries and ministers. Yeah, no, ha happy to, to do that. You, you'll know that the portfolio has changed at, at, at the reshuffle time. Um, so Shirley Ann Somerville is a minute of the, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People. Um, within that sits Equalities and Human Rights. So she's 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 a boss uh, when, it, when it comes to that. Uh, for responsibility for, for committee and, and taking forward some of the programme work, when it comes to Equalities and Human Rights and Older People, that, that's me. But we obviously work in a partnership um, a, a process in order to do that. So Shirley Ann Somerville, as a cabinet secretary, will answer to the Social Security Committee because that's a substantive part of her role. When it comes to the work of equalities, uh, human rights and um, older people, then I would be uh, answering to this committee unless you have specific asks on the cabinet secretary. But it's, it's a pretty flexible arrangement, but we have very, very clear lines of responsibility. Equalities, human rights and older people is me with the oversight from uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Okay, and I mean, obviously, there's, there's a crossover with equalities and human rights to local government, and that sits within um, Aileen Campbell's um, responsibility. And I suppose my concern comes from a starting point of if there's a bit here and a bit there and a bit somewhere else, um, at, at some point there may be a, a, a position where no one takes responsibility and we can't allow any of this to kind of slip off the agenda. So how do we make sure we always keep a real focus on it? Well, no, I, I, I agree with you and understand where, where the concern is coming from. And the post that I, have, I am now in what was, um, has got a responsibility to do all of that cross-cutting work. So when it comes to equalities and human rights, I'm it. Mm -hmm. So I'm the person responsible. I I'm absolutely agree with you about that sort of a silo sitting mm -hmm. where things may be set in specific portfolios. That's why the majority of my work is done in joint ministerial committees or joint ministerial steering groups mm -hmm. or two ministers working together on, uh, on, on many aspects. So, for instance, on the, the issue that, that you're very interested in in Gypsy Travellers, mm -hmm. when it comes to Gypsy Travellers housing issues, Kevin Stewart and I are working very closely together mm -hmm. on that. Every action that is taken that affects Gypsy Travellers is a joint uh, mm -hmm. endeavour. The same with health, uh, with Joe Fitzpatrick, mm -hmm. the same with children and young people, with Marie Todd. So there's a very, very clear understanding there that people do have responsibility mm -hmm. for taking forward the policy, but I also have a, a, a responsibility to making, making sure that equalities and human rights are reflected through all of that work and that's why that sort of a partnership working is ongoing. I'm developing that as we go along. It was the role the First Minister asked me to undertake and I'm developing it as we go along and it's developing into something really functional now and we're now seeing some real progress mm. being made because we're able to do that, take forward the policy work, but through a human rights and equalities prism, which is something that this committee was really mm. asking to be, to be done for a long time. I know I led some of those calls. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister, and good morning to your colleagues as well. Um, further up to Mary Fee's line of questioning, it is gratifying to hear that you recognise that you are the, the human rights leader in the Scottish Government, because without it being, um, if it becomes everybody's responsibility, it often becomes nobody's responsibility. So it's good to hear there's leadership there, and I think everybody on this committee recognises your credentials in that regard. However, you can't be everywhere at all times, and obviously a, a good degree of the work of government is actually performed by the civil service. Um, can you give us a flavour of how you can see the sort of upskilling of the civil service to be human rights literate in their work so that while they're preparing policy um, for you to sign off on or for your colleagues to sign off on, that they have a basic understanding of where we need to get to as a country? 
No, absolutely. The, the exact same process that I explained uh, to Mary Fee about how ministers are working together is that the same process is happening now with, with, with officials. Um, there's a very, very clear understanding that, that we do have to do much more of that cross-cutting work and it all has to join up. It has to make a difference because you will know that you know that a developing development of a policy in an area could, could get to get to a certain stage but if you don't have some of that influence around about equalities and human rights to push it over over that line that, that's very different so the officials have spent we spent the summer meeting with all of the stakeholders all of the officials we have very very clear and um, uh, regular meetings with the whole of the equality <laughs> unit in the room to talk about the joint work that we need to do so for instance last week we had a heads of service in a meeting last week and um, Hilary Third, who leads on Gypsy Travellers was talking about all the work we were doing in Gypsy Travellers and Harry who's leading on um, disability and race was talking about the work he's doing and actually the work he was about to under take is work that we've maybe already done. So it was very easy for me in that, that situation to say, why don't you and Hilary and Harry work together in order to make sure that we, we use all of the learning that we have had from the Gypsy Traveller work that we have done to in, in, inform the work that Harry's now doing around about race and disability and some of the issues there. Because it's the same issues, it's discrimination, it's barriers, it's policy that we can modify and change in order to make things better. And rather than starting at the beginning for Harry, he was able to come in at a stage where we'd already learned some of the lessons and take some of that work forward. So that's a very clear uh, uh, understanding of where we are. But you're absolutely right. So across the, the top end of government where, where we're uh, analysing data, a lot of that's now cross-cutting as well. And the key word that I've been taking forward in all of the work we do is intersectionality. We are not just one protected characteristic, we are a myriad of protected characteristics and those characteristics all have responsibility in just about every single portfolio in government. So it's about joining all of that up. Excellent. Um, and, and can I just ask, is, um, can you foresee in the future that human rights training may um, form part of the, the induction, certainly of senior civil servants who are in charge of leading policy development? We, we're looking very closely at how we can do that. There is a lot of skill and a lot of expertise in government right now. <clears throat> it's maybe making sure that, that that's, that's crystallised and, and brought into focus. So we're doing a bit of work on how, how we can understand that now. We're obviously working very closely with some of our key partners, the Equality Human Rights Commission, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and of course on this particular topic on human rights budgeting uh, and some of the work that we funded the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission to do that. They're coming back and doing some additional work on that in the new year, um, again, to inform the work that we do, to inform uh, the officials and to ensure you know, that actually what we are doing here makes a difference there. Great. Um, on a completely unrelated area, well, it's not unrelated, but it's a, a separate area, could you possibly provide us with an update on progress on matters that were raised in the committee's report that I think you actually signed off on um, as chair of the committee, um, which was looking ahead to Scotland's uh, government's draft budget 18-19, making the most of equalities and human rights levers. Can you tell us where we are on that? Well, there's a few updates because uh, on all of the sections of the questions that, that, that were asked. So obviously the Equality Budget Advisory Group was a spe specific ask about how we can ensure that we you know, make that function uh, more effectively um, to uh, in ensure that we are better informed in all of that. And that was the reason why I felt an independent chair would be the way to go with that, because an independent chair can bring you know, a very, very different perspective into government on uh, their thoughts and their feelings on many of the aspects of how we do budgeting, how we respond to the budget, and how we ensure that we mainstream equalities and human rights across that budget. And that's why Angela Hagan was a perfect uh, example of that. So that was one of the, the, the questions, and, and that, that was the update on that. The chair of EBAG, I know, has written to all of the subject uh, uh, committees in October, reminding them of their responsibility uh, to ensure um, that uh, mainstreaming with re and, and also with regard to the public sector equality duty and, and how we work on that. We would welcome the continued support of this committee to work with Angela Hagan to ensure that, that we can make that progress that we, that we want to see. Um, equalities and human rights mainstreamed across the, the whole of government. So that's two aspects of the asks that were in the, the progress report. The other um, aspect of EBAG is they've now submitted a work plan, and I think maybe you've already had sight of that, yeah? Uh, uh, and that's uh, due to be uh, more informed by the work of the Human Rights Advisory Group. Um, 
and how we take some of those recommendations forward. So we are looking to get together in the spring in order to do that. And I know one of the asks of the committee was to have a tripartite uh, meeting. Um, I'm very, very happy to, to, to um, uh, be part of the tripartite meeting with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and uh, the committee. But all of the recommendations in the advisory group, some of the recommendations from EBAG, will all be taken forward in, in that, that process at that point. I mean, there's a few other updates on uh, some of the other work that, that you commissioned um, or we asked for at the time. Um, I think maybe I've covered just about all of that and as far as EBAG and the Human Rights um, Advisory Group goes. The other updates were around about some specific areas um, in uh, some of the areas where we were focused on about gender and uh, child poverty, poverty. And you'll know that we're working very closely with stakeholders in order to develop um, a gender index in government so that we can match everything to make sure that it makes that, that difference, that we can see where the intersectional data uh, takes us and where the gaps are, where we can focus our attention but also where we're doing some really, really good work which we can highlight and share. And that was an example of the Hillary and Harry situation where we've done great work with Gypsy Travellers. Therefore, you know, we, can, we can use that to inform the other work we're doing in, in, in government. Uh, working really closely with stakeholders. I've had lots of meetings, introductory meetings over the summer and then follow-up meetings over uh, the last wee period about how we take forward some of that work. And all of it's been informed by, by your stakeholders. Um, real proper partnership working here. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Annie. Good morning and thank you for coming in today. Um, I just would like to ask a couple of questions. One on the, the committee's letter to the Scottish Government, which outlined the four key areas that we would like it to address. So really the question is, can the Minister update the committee on any work that's being undertaken in terms of developing such equalities data and whether the Government intends to publish additional equalities data in advance of Summer recess 2019. Yeah, well, let me just think because there's qu there's quite quite a lot of information in that. The gender index is one of the key pieces of work about how we I identify the the, work, the information that we need. There's obviously some work in how we um, develop uh, and use equality impact assessments in order to uh, um, have data. There's there's new um, points in the national performance framework. There's new, and uh, we can put specific um, questions into the Scottish Household Survey, which, which we're in, intended to do and ha have, have done as well. So there's a whole host of areas where we can gather all of that data that's then how we use that that's important. Um, and that's where the gender index will really come into play and in ensuring that we can um, end the, some of the inequalities uh, in gender um, and how we do that. But some of the intersectionality of that, whether you're a woman in poverty, you've you got a disability, you're from a minority ethnic background, we're really trying to drill into some of that rich data because it's some of those areas is where we need to make some of the progress. And just a very small supplementary on that. Um, back in the, the, dra the, budget, the draft budget and our comments on that last year as a committee, one of, the, one of the, the statements was that we asked the Scottish Government to maintain a focus on addressing known systemic equality issues across government portfolios while collecting robust evidence. Um, and I've, I've been contacted by CREA just to, to sort of ask the question about what is the Scottish Government doing about gathering race equality data to identify existing disparities and track the progress to address them? Um, I might need to come back to you on the actual detail of that because we have been talking to Claire about some of this uh, work that we're undertaking right now and obviously the Race Equality Action Plan is at its first anniversary. We had a really uh, excellent conference in mm -hmm. conjunction with Claire just um, last week on um, some of the learning from that and some of the, the information that we still need to take forward. So we're working very closely with Claire, with BEMIS and with other organisations in, in order to, to get there but let me get you the actual detail on some of that and come back to you. Um, it will be clearer than, than, than me trying to pull it out the back of my head um, uh, for, for the purposes of the committee today. But I'll, I'll be able to get you a very clear update on where we are with that. But to reassure you that that work on the Race Equality Action Plan, the data that we need from it and how we use that data is, is incredibly important in the work that we are doing. And all of that's been informed by super organisations like CREA. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK. Um, Fulton McGregor. Uh, good morning, Minister, and, and your colleagues. Um, actually, in your opening statement and some of the answers you've given to colleagues already, um, you've more or less 
um, covered some of the areas I was going to ask about, particularly around the, the FM's advisory group and taking on board the recommendations. But I'm wondering if you can just expand a wee bit on the, uh, what the government is doing to develop the equality data sets and indicators. Um, I'd follow on from Annie Wells' question just there. It's much the, 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 the same as the, the answers that I've just yeah. given. It's, it's the work that we are doing in order to gather that data using the stakeholders. It's the gender index. It's the recommendations for the advisory group. Also, the recommendations that we expect to, to see uh, uh, from the First Minister's um, advisory group for women and girls, which I believe they've got big asks to. Um, so a lot of uh, work going on to identify where do we need to make progress, where have we already made the progress, and how can we make that progress, especially how can we make that progress by working in partnership with the people who are asking us to make that progress um, to ensure that we, we, we see it coming. So all, all of the things that I've already yeah. mentioned are, are the ways we're doing that. I appreciate that. It was quite yeah. covered a lot earlier. Yeah. Thank you, Camilla. Were you not going to ask about the human rights report as well? No, I don't think I'm going to ask those questions. Sorry. Okay, we'll move on to Linda Fabiani then. Okay, I, I've got a, a couple of things I'd like to ask. Um, it may be that the committee's covered some of it before as a substitute. I'm not always up to date. Um, I'd like to go back to what Alex Cole Hamilton was talking about and what you described, Minister, as intersectionality, uh, which is, is always absolutely super in theory, and that's what, what we all strive for. Um, but you may be aware that I did quite a bit of work with the Young Women Lead Project. And these young women chose to investigate and do an inquiry on sexual harassment in schools. And I know that the committee took evidence, yes. Uh -huh. And it was, it was a very, very good piece of work, but what struck me very strongly about it was there was all sorts of elements in there. The sexual harassment in school element was sometimes informed by disability as well sometimes informed by race, and there wasn't always a pick-up of that in the opinion of the young women who gave evidence, and <coughs> indeed some of the, the teachers who gave evidence and, and experts. And I know it's a difficult, a difficult thing to do, but it also became quite clear to me in some of my own investigations that when we then had the bullying policy that came from the education side of uh, of government. There wasn't all, always a recognition in there of sexual harassment, for example, as a kind of bullying, of racial abuse as a, a very distinct kind of bullying. And I certainly don't have the answers, but I wonder as, you know, Equalities Minister and the effort that government is making to do all that cross-boundary stuff, um, how you feel that's going. I'm aware of the, the Equally Safe initiative, uh, and again, having looked at that, I know it was only a pilot to start with, and it may well be rolled out, um, but are we really pulling in all the intersectionality that's required amongst the themes and amongst government departments? Yeah. Um, thanks for that very detailed uh, question. Uh, I've got, I've, I can assure you that the Equally Safe in Schools has been rolled out to all 32 local authorities. That's, that's a commitment that's, that's being made uh, in order to ensure that we take forward some of the work that we do. Some of this is cross-cutting with my education colleagues, and it's a very clear example of uh, the work I spoke about earlier, about how we're working together to realise all this. We, we all know, you know that the committee had made some very, very clear recommendations around about prejudice-based bullying and how we tackle that. One aspect of that was what, uh, uh, you know, a reflection a number of the questions this morning was the data and how we collect the data and how we uh, break that data down uh, into um, a format that shows us that intersectionality issue. So there's been um, a few million pounds, I think about four million pounds investment in the CMIS programme in schools in order for the better data collection of the types of bullying. So it wouldn't just be, you know, bullying, it would be bullying based on race, gender, disability, you know, religion, whatever it was. Um, and then there'd be some subsections in that as well. So I've not seen the template for this yet, but I believe that's the type of data that, that, that the committee looked for at the time, but also um, the, the type of data that we now need in order to deal with some of the challenges in schools. You're absolutely right about equally safe in schools. Equally safe in schools also takes um, it forward some of the work um, that Rape Crisis Scotland has, have been doing around about stamp and um, consent education and how we deal with consent, how young boys 
view consent, how young girls view consent, and how we can educate them more to understand that. And there's a lot of work going on in that right now. You're absolutely right that the Scottish Government's policy didn't settle down on some of the terms like sexual harassment in school, because I think when children are under 16, it's a very different prospect of what, what that means. And some of it is about education and not criminality. Um, so, so there's a very, very um, sensitive um, position around about how we handle that and how we handle it effectively for both the perpetrator and, and the victim. So, so there's a bit of sensitivity, and it's very, very individualistic as well, uh, which makes it difficult to have a sort of a homogenous type policy that would deal, deal with everything. I know that the Cabinet Secretary is working very closely with Respect Me and other organisations who have raised some of the issues around about sexual harassment in schools and maybe how we define that and how we work on that, and that works out ongoing as we speak. So that's already ongoing too. I know the Young Women Lead Programme have some very, very clear recommendations in this, and I'm sure for my education colleagues that will help inform the work that they're currently doing on that. Um, on um, Equally Safe in a wider context, um, we spend about £11.7 million pounds from the equalities budget. There's budgets, um, I think, about eight and a half million from health. There's about two and a half million from um, justice. So there's a very, very clear focus on ending discrimination against women and girls. And all of these issues all fall within that umbrella and the work that we're doing there. Very, very clear working relationship with COSLA. Everything we do in Equally Safe is a partnership approach. And that ensures that when we do do work in schools and in local authorities, that it gets right to the front line and we do make that change. But we're still some challenges ahead of us. But I believe that the work that I've seen some of the young women and young men in schools that are, have un been undertaking the Equally Safe project will be transform for, transformational for schools. And for some of the work that we've seen when I was on the committee about that whole school approach, really making that difference. Um, it's difficult to always legislate away discrimination and bullying and harassment, but we are making some great progress on this with overarching policy and some direct policy too. Okay, can I go on to the next bit? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's very positive. Um, it was interesting to hear that Equally Safe, for example, is getting rolled out across 32 local authorities, and that, that's good news. But back to that initial question that was asked by Mary about who's in charge. I, there's an issue for me, which is that the theory is, is always very good. But sometimes when it disseminates down, the practice doesn't quite match the theory. And there's, there's different levels of application across local authorities, for example, but also other public bodies, whatever they may be. So... Is there discussion, whether with COSLA or whether with individual local authorities, about making equalities and human rights as important within each of the public authorities as it obviously is for government? And who is going to lead on this? Because, again, I would quote bullying policy, for example, and I'm sure everybody in this room has constituency cases about bullying. I'm also pretty sure that if we compared experiences of how it's dealt with by the various local authorities, each case would be would be different. And, and it's not about laying down laws to local authorities. <coughs> the example of, of human rights and equalities is a great way um, to be saying to people, cross-cutting, intersectionality right across your public body and getting that understanding there so that everyone does it automatically. Who's in charge? Equally safe, me. I chair the Joint Strategic Board, co-chair it with COSLA, with Ke Kelly Parry, who's the Equalities um, spokesperson for COSLA. So we both co-chair the, the, the Joint Strategic Board. The Strategic Board is made up of some government officials, but the majority of it is made up of stakeholders, of uh, individuals working across other um, disciplines, health, education and justice, including the Crown Office and the police, are all represented on that. And some of the main driving uh, driver stakeholders, like Marshall Scott, Sandy Brindley, people like that, who have got um, real investment and real drive in all of this. So the Joint Strategic Board, that's the work that, that, they, that we do. We are working very, very closely with COSLA as our partner in this, because uh, we realise that we can make all the policy we like here, that's a local delivery that matters. And, and the magic of this is both having continuity of the application of that 
policy, but also flexibility enough for local authorities to have it flexible enough to, to, to address their, their individual needs. Now, nobody's saying that we have solved this at local authority level by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a huge amount of work going on in order to make sure that equally safe means what it says in the tin, especially for, for, for our school kids. Um, and the work that's been undertaken to, to realise that is a, a huge investment in government. About half of the equality budget goes... 50% of the quality budget goes to Equally Safe um, uh, and the Equally Safe uh, uh, programmes that we're currently running. Um, and that budget was, was set, has set for three years. So there was continuity within the budget as well. There was, there was um, safety and security within the budget, and that budget set until 2020. So although we are having some negotiations on the overall budget here, as far as these programmes goes, that, that budget is safe, it's set, and it's working. Thank you. So we just get on to you if we've got an issue. <laughs> <laughs> you know where to find <coughs> Minister, can I ask what progress has been made on developing a human rights-based budgeting, um, a human rights-based approach <laughs> to budgeting, forgive me, um, and is that something that you'll oversee or does that sit elsewhere in the government? Yeah, again, it's some of the, the, the work that's, that's cross-cutting. So we're working very closely with the Scottish Human Rights Commission. We, we, we obviously funded some work for them to do um, some analysis on human rights budgeting, and the, they had their human rights mas budgeting masterclass, um, which I attended, actually, on behalf of the committee. Um, the, the plan is to do that again, to, to mark progress. So part, part of the work that, that we have done is obviously understanding human rights budgeting, how that has an impact on what we do, how when, when you do that, especially in times of austerity, you, you protect you know, the most vulnerable in that sense if you apply that approach. So that work's un, been un, undertaken right now. It's um, working alongside our colleagues in COSLA again, because you know it's fine having the policy, but it's the local delivery that really matters. Um, we obviously... Um, are supportive of the work that Scottish Human Rights Commission is doing because as an independent body, they can give us advice um, and information, but also challenge and how we can you know, step up another step forward in order to make that difference when it comes to how we do human rights budgeting. So I think in the spring, they're planning another uh, masterclass, which we are fully uh, in support of. And we're taking some uh, information from across international bodies and how we do that better too. Because some of the, the, the UN treaty obligations is about how we make sure we spend money in the right places too. And we're looking at all of that. Um, Linda Fabiani touched on um, local authority input there. And, um, one of the things when we um, took evidence from local authorities that we spent a bit of time talking about was equality impact assessments and the sort of varying degrees of um, quality of them, I suppose, and just whether they were being done or not. We also touched on cumulative equality impact assess um, assessments. And I know that um, the Cabinet Secretary touches on that on her letter, but I just wonder if, for, for the record, you would like to, to comment on that. Yeah, if anybody knows me, you know that I've always had a bit of a hobby horse when it comes to quality impact assessments. And I think the officials were quite uh, sick hearing from me over the summer when I was appointed to say, what are we doing about quality impact assessments? So what are we doing about quality impact assessments? Part of the gender index and all of the work we're doing about data collection uh, uh, and, and the intersectionality work we're doing in the, the data analyst side of government, equality impact assessments is, is forming a huge part of that. We are um, identifying, there's a bit of work going on right now to identify the gold standard equality impact assessment and how we can use that as a template in order to ensure that other people follow that, that, that work, when it, you know, that high standard of work, to make sure that actually equality impact assessment isn't just about ticking the boxes and getting you know, the bits of paper filled in and sent away, it's about actually making that, that difference. Um, and I know that the quality of equality impact assessments um, vary. Um, so that's why we decided to undertake the piece of work about finding the gold standard. Let's get a few equality impact assessments that are the best ones that are on some national um, um, policies. And we're looking at some of the work that we do in government in order to, to do that. So that work's ongoing to identify that. The other piece of work that's ongoing is a review of the public sector equality duty, which has a whole aspect to um, involving equality impact assessments. And the work that we are doing in setting that gold standard will inform that work going forward forward about what we would expect from public authorities going forward when it comes to equality impact assessments. The data that should be included in that and the action that should come from that to make sure that actually we're making that difference and it's done at the earliest stage of any development. 
earlier that um, we don't want silos of things and nothing's done in, in isolation. So what about that point about the cumulative ones? It seemed like everyone felt it was a good idea and um, some local authorities had tried to do it. And certainly when I was a councillor, we yeah. spoke about it, but it's, it's hugely complicated. Do we have people looking at how we could do that? It feels that if, if we could get to the point where that was happening, that, that we might be... It's all forming part of the work that we are doing in order uh, to, to inform the review, but in order to inform the data collection that the government's currently uh, undertaking. Because uh, we're very, very clear that we've made progress in lots of areas, but there's areas <coughs> where there is that intersectionality, where there's additional barriers for people, and it's about making sure we've got that, that data collected properly. We're working very closely with local authorities. The last thing we want to do is to give them a, another onerous exercise in order to undertake, and I know that many of them felt cumulative impact assessment did that. However, my argument would be if you do an impact assessment well at the beginning, then having to go back and, and fix it, retrofit it um, at a later stage is much more onerous on a council. So we're hoping that the work we're doing and making sure that we've got the gold standard equality impact assessment will inform their work at the early stage, especially in budget setting, in order to ensure that they don't need to go back and fix it at a later date, which just uses up more resources, more time, and makes the whole pro process onerous. So simplification I suppose I'd be um, lacking if I didn't ask, what's the time scales for, for this work? When, when are we likely to see changes well, and improvements? Let, let, me, let me go and, and check on the time scale specifically for you on that, and I'll come back to you on that Thank one, you. Um, just to see where we're at. I'll get an update. OK, perfect. Thank you, Minister. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. I wondered if the uh, Minister had taken note of the recommendation in the Committee's Getting Rights Right report, uh, which seeks additional resources to allow the third sector to engage in the international treaty process and if uh, the minister had any comment on that. Uh, yes, we, we've taken note of all of the recommendations in the report. We're currently um, you know, making some headway in how we understand some of that, what it means, where that responsibility would lie and how we can take that forward. So there'll be a more formal response uh, to the committee report on that, but that work's currently being undertaken. So. Um, I, I wouldn't have, you know, accurate information to give you on the specificity of that right now, but we probably would have in the new year. Okay. No, I look forward, to, uh, and I'm sure other committee members will, to seeing that, yeah. that information. There'll be a full um, response comes back to every recommendation in the report. Excellent. Um, I'd be annoying then and ask you about another one, <laughs> um, yeah. but uh, it was uh, just about increased funding for advocacy support, which is something, uh, as you'll know, that the committee has highlighted in several areas of its work. and. I know that you're going to come back with a substantive response in the new year, but is, is there a sort of agreement in principle uh, that that's an area that, that does need additional resourcing? Well, whilst we're in the midst of a, a committee, a, a budget um, negotiation, I probably wouldn't be in a position to commit anything that costs anything yeah. at this, this point, and that's my very honest answer to you, uh, Mr Mundell. I think um, the substantive response from, from the government along with the, the budget process will, will be a way to answer your question, but not quite right now. Okay, but you will make the case within government for additional resources. <laughs> I have just seen Sean qualities. taking a note of what you have just <laughs> asked for, and we'll make sure we can ask the question you're back. Thank you very much, and thank you for your, uh, your candidness. Okay, Minister, um, the, <laughs> the new national performance framework included the human rights a national outcome we respect, protect and fulfil human rights and live free from discrimination. Can I ask how government's measuring that outcome? So you'll know that in addition to the headline human rights outcome, there's seven other national outcomes in the, the, the NPF that map directly to all of the international human rights uh, framework treaties. Um, it's also linked specifically to sustainable development goals. So that links straight to the work that I know that you want to ensure that we are doing with international bodies and treaties. The, all of the eight outcomes are supported by uh, 31 national indicators, um, which you know just shows you how it's all, all, all built. And these new outcomes and indicators were developed in very, very close consultation with our colleagues in the Scottish Human Rights uh, Committee mission and uh, wider uh, civil society and stakeholders who had plenty to say on this and that's informed all of our work. Um, the combined outcomes and indicators provide um, uh, 
a very sophisticated means of tracking that progress, which is the substance of your question, and Scotland's overall performance um, on, on a human rights basis as well. Um, for example, the National Performance Framework directly addresses a number of rights. Um, right to life is a clear one. Health, ad adequate standard of living, including uh, food and housing, and we're doing some work on food and housing right now. Um, just and favourable conditions in work, which is the gender pay gap and the fairer work work that we're doing. And cultural life uh, is obviously all of the work that uh, my colleague um, uh, uh, Fiona has lots of doing in, in her uh, portfolio. So, the National Performance Framework, I think, in ensuring that we've got all of these eight and then the 31, um, embeds human rights principles into to everything that we do. So it sort of probably answers everybody's questions uh, uh, this morning on how we can ensure that dignity, gender, equality, that public services treat people properly, that their people are treated with dignity and respect, uh, that the gender balance in, in the gender pay gap is dealt with, the disability pay gap is dealt with, the disability um, employment stats are, 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 are in, uh, indicated and dedicated and we have a way of, of tracking uh, progress on that. We've made a commitment to half the disability employment uh, gap, which is a huge um, undertaking. And we're also very, very uh, specifically dedicated to children's rights and how we, we change that as well. So they all tie in the eight outcomes of 31 indicators all tie in uh, to the work that the committee uh, has worked on for the past few years and where you want to see that progress. Um, and we would hope by using those indicators and those outcomes that we can then you know, track that performance and, and whether we've made progress, I suspect we have. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, um, the Fairer Scotland duty has been in force for nine months now. Um, are you seeing differences in terms of budget making decisions can you point to the the green shoots of hope yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> it's obviously it's very early doors um, okay. and 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 we know that we put a lot of pressure on public authorities uh, uh, to to um, step up and take on some of of this work and and, and make sure that we see that progress um, it goes back to the point i made earlier about if we can do that at the earliest stage um, it informs the, the, the whole pro process as well. But it's quite early doors on this. Um, and, yeah, I'm seeing some good uh, progress in hearing, because you start to hear some of the language being uh, engaged in the work that other public authorities and local authorities are doing, and you start to hear that now. Um, and I'm very, very sensitive and alert to hearing some of the key words and thinking, oh, oh, they've listened. So we're seeing some of that now, but we can certainly get a, a further update. Maybe once a, it's a year in, would maybe be a better time to maybe okay. look at that progress and give you some of the data on that. That would be helpful. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, well, thank you for your evidence um, this morning. Um, our next meeting is on Thursday, the 10th of January, and will be our first meeting of 2019. We will take evidence on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill at Stage 2 from the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration. So I'll move into private session now and we can clear the gallery. <laughs>